My friend and I recently visited an exhibition that brought to life some of the letters that Vincent van Gogh sent to his brother Theo. Van Gogh sent more than 650 letters throughout his life and although it does feel like an invasion of privacy, it has of course served as a biographical tool that helped provide some context as to what it was like to live for him. At the end I'll also briefly share some new additions to my art history TBR list. I know this is not like my usual bookish content because I'm currently preparing some analytical videos for my read and discuss playlist launching around January and meanwhile enjoy this is one of my favorite letters 14th of August 1870. My dear Theo, it's mainly to tell you that I'm grateful for your visit that I'm writing to you. It was quite a long time ago that we saw each other or wrote to each other as we used to. All the same, it's better that we feel something for each other rather than behave like corpses towards one another. The more so because as long as one had no real right to be called a corpse by being legally dead, it's max of hypocrisy, or at least childishness to build as such childish in the manner of a young man of 14 years who thinks that his dignity and social standing actually oblige him to wear a top hat. The hours we spent together in this way have at least assured us that we're both still in the land of the living. When I saw you again and took a walk with you, I had the same feeling I used to have more than I do now, as though life were something good and precious that one should cherish, and I felt more cheerful and alive than I had been for a long time, because in spite of myself, life has gradually become, or has seemed, much less precious to me, much more unimportant and different. When one lives with others and is bound by a feeling of affection, one is aware that one has a reason for being, that one might not be entirely worthless and superfluous, but perhaps good for one thing or another, considering that we need one another and are making the same journey as traveling companions. Proper self-respect, however, is also very dependent on relations with others. A prisoner who's kept in isolation, who's prevented from working, would, would in the long run, especially if this were to last too long, suffer the consequences just as surely as one who went hungry for too long. Like everyone else, I have need of relationships, of friendship or affection or of trusting companionship, and I'm not like a street pump or a lamppost, whether of stone or iron, so that I can't do without them without perceiving an emptiness and feeling their lack, like any other generally civilized and highly respectable man. And I tell you these things to let you know what a salutary effect your visit had on me. As I think back on your visit with thankfulness, our talks naturally come to mind. I've heard such talks before, many, in fact, and often. Plans for improvement and change and raising the spirits, and yet, don't let it anger you, I'm a little afraid of them, also because I sometimes acted upon them and ended up rather disappointed. The time spent at Amsterdam is still so fresh in my memory. You were there yourself, and so you know how the pros and cons were weighed, considered and deliberated upon, reasoned with wisdom, how it was well meant, and yet, how pitiful the result, how daft the whole business, how grossly stupid. Something similar, I fear, will be the result of following wise counsel given was the best of intentions. For such experiences are pretty drastic for me. The damage, the sorrow, the heart's regretfulness is too great for both of us not to have learned the hard way. If we don't learn from this, what shall we then learn from? A striving such as reaching the goal set before me, it, as it was put then, truly, that is an ambition that will easily take hold of me again. The desire to achieve it has cooled considerably, and I now look at things from a different perspective. Even though it may sound and look attractive, and even though it's unacceptable to think about it as experience taught me to think about it. I would rather die a natural death than be prepared for it by the academy, and have occasionally had a lesson from a grass mower that seemed to me more useful than one in Greek. Improvement in my life. Should I not desire it, or should I not be in need of improvement? I really want to improve, but it's precisely because I yearn for it that I'm afraid of remedies that are worse than the disease. Can you blame a sick person if he looks the doctor straight in the eye and prefers not to be treated wrongly or by a quack? Does someone who has consumption or typhus do wrong by maintaining a that a stronger remedy than barley water might be useful, or even necessary, or finding that barley water in itself can do no harm, nevertheless doubts its efficacy and potency in this particular case? The doctor who prescribed barley water mustn't say, this patient is a stubborn person who sets upon his own room because he doesn't want to take medicine. No, because the man is not unwilling, but the so-called medicine was unsuitable, because it was indeed it, but still not yet it at all. Do you blame someone if he fails to be moved by a painting which is recorded in the catalogue as a memling, but which has nothing to do with the memling, other than it's a similar subject from the Gothic period but without artistic value? I honestly think it would be better if the relationship between us were more trusting on both sides. 
If I must seriously feel that I'm annoying or burdensome to you or those at home, useful for neither one thing or another, and were to go on being forced to feel like an intruder or a fifth wheel in your presence, so that it would be better if I weren't there, and if I should have to continue trying to keep further and further out of other people's way, if I think that indeed it would be so and cannot be otherwise, then I'm overcome by a feeling of sorrow and I must struggle against despair. It's difficult for me to bear these thoughts, and more difficult still to bear the thought that so much discord, misery, and sorrow in our midst and in our family has been caused by me. If it were indeed so, then I truly wish that it be granted to me not to have to go on living too long. Yet whenever this depresses me beyond measure, all too deeply, after a long time the thought also occurs to me. It's perhaps only a bad, terrible dream, and later we'll perhaps learn to understand and comprehend it better. But is it not, after all, reality, and won't it one day become better rather than worse? To many it would no doubt appear foolish and superstitious to believe in any improvement for the better. Sometimes in winter it's so bitterly cold that one says, it's simply too cold, what do I care whether summer comes, the bad outweighs the good. But whether we like it or not, an end finally comes to the hard frost, and one fine morning the wind has turned and we have a thaw. Comparing the natural state of the weather with our state of mind and our circumstances, subject to variableness and change, I still have some hope that it can improve. Adieu, accept in thought a handshake, and believe me, yours truly, Vincent. I did a post not so long ago sharing some art literature books on my TBR. Since then, I haven't added a lot more, so this will be a very brief section. But here's to the books I'm excited to share and get to in the upcoming 2022. Did you enjoy that letter? I definitely did, which is why I'm so, so excited to start reading Ever Yours, the Essential Letters collection. It's a volume of around a thousand pages long with the essential correspondence between Van Gogh and the people he was close with. And I am particularly looking forward to it because of the commentary. Hopefully, I mean, from what I've seen so far, it looks like a very detailed in depth book, but I am, like I said, happy that there are a lot of letters available in public domain so I will link that website in the description box too, so you can check it out in case you don't want to spend money on the book. Recently, I finished Caravaggio, which is one of the Tashian series. Honestly, these are like crazy expensive and I was so, so lucky to find them on a discount. But if you find one and it's on a sale and you have the money to spare and you're wondering whether to get it or not, honestly, I really recommend it because uh, even though the price is quite hefty, I do think it's really worth it from the quality alone. Let's take a closer look. Some of the pages are literally gold, the quality of the paper is incredible and the prints too. I also love how there's a commentary to the paintings and there's zooms into certain details. It really helps you build an appreciation for the artist. It's a very information heavy, it's like every page there's just so much thrown at you that I was worried I didn't retain as much as I would have liked. But actually the paintings that you love the most, their information most definitely sticks and you learn to recognize the art style too. And I think you can always refresh on the biography later. So if you're intimidated looking at this, it's heavy, I know, don't be. So I'm on the lookout for more Tashkin editions. I currently have my eye on the Vermeer one, and I know I only read one book, but I am confident enough to say that I'm sure that I will like the entire like series of Tashkin literature because I have flipped through some of the other books that were in the bookshop there, and I do have to say it looks so far that the quality is there in all of them, and the language was just so eloquent, so I think it works perfectly if you're looking to do a deep dive on a particular artist. Speaking of Vermeer, my friend Alif, I will also link her account in the description box, she recommended The Girl with a Pearl Earring ages ago. I know I asked you for your favorite books, I'm still reading them since there were more than 50 years responses, so I'm just slowly getting around to all of them. I will probably have to split the video into like parts because it's massive. I am really, really looking forward to finally starting this book in 2022, and I find the entire concept of fictionalizing inanimate objects fascinating or focusing on details that weren't previously explored before. Madeline Miller looking at Circe right there, but uh, in case you didn't get it, The Girl with a Pearl Earring is a painting with, by Vermeer, and the book follows like the fictional story behind it, although it does have a lot of like historical elements to it. So 
I think it sounds amazing. The Agony and the Ecstasy by Irving Stone. This is a biography of Michelangelo and I don't really know much about Michelangelo other than the fact that he painted the Sistine Chapel and I have a copy of his, I have a replica of his David as a pencil holder on my desktop because I do really love that statue. So I'm just really excited to find out more about his life and who he was as a person and I've heard very good things about this biography so I'm very intrigued to see if it is as good as I've hyped it up to be in my expectations. I did link my RTVR post in the description box but I figured like in case someone doesn't have Instagram this is just some very quick snapshots from that post so you can take a screenshot too. Thank you so much for being here and watching my channel in 2021. Here's to 2022 and let's finish on a great note with Van Gogh as we did at the start. And end finally comes to the hard frost and one fine morning the wind has turned and we have a thaw. Stay happy, stay healthy and happy almost new year.